We're officially past the halfway mark in the year, and that means it's time to see how we're doing. Has it been a good year? Are there good co-op games for you and your best friends? Will Elden Ring win game of the year? Well, that last one seems a bit obvious, but in this video, we'll focus on that second question. Are there any good co-op games for you guys as of this point? Now, let me quickly set the stage. We're not creating a rank or list video, just compiling games that so far have stood out to us. Think of it almost like a review roundup from our monthly videos, but with only the best of the best from each month. We also want to be upfront and admit we haven't had the time to play every co-op game that's released this year. But one of the advantages of doing our co-op monthly videos is that, generally speaking, we have a pretty good idea of each co-op game that released and what everybody's perception is of it. So we'll do our best to recognize our limitations and potential biases while still recognizing as many successful titles as possible. And if we miss anything, that's where you come in. Let us know if there's a co-op game we need to have on our radar for when we look back on the entire year in December. So with that out of the way, let's cover the best co-op games of the year so far. Starting things off in January was Nobody Saves the World, which quickly became one of the most popular games of the year. Now, usually games that launch in January, yeah, they're quickly forgotten, but this nobody has stuck in our minds long enough to become somebody. See what I did there? Yeah, anyways. Half Dungeon Crawler, half ARPG, and features two-player co-op both online and local, I mean, come on now. The real star of the show, though, is the shape-shifting mechanic that allows your character to morph into all sorts of wacky forms and they each come with their own movesets and upgrade paths. Now of course, this becomes even better in co-op by finding which forms synergize together. There's a lot more depth to this game that I'm totally glancing over because frankly, we haven't played it ourselves just yet. But trust me, we definitely will before the year's over. I think a lot of people wrote off Rainbow Six Distraction as just another cash grab. For one, it's Ubisoft, so can we even blame you for thinking that? But two, it's pretty dang similar to the limited time mode in Siege it obviously evolved from. Thing is, we've never played Siege, so we were able to look at what's here a bit more objectively. What we saw is a good 4 player online co-op game. It doesn't break the wheel, but mostly achieves what it's going for. You have to play a strategy meticulously aware of all your surroundings. It can be super tense, and we love that feeling of scouting things out together, pinging enemies, and using our abilities in tandem. It can be tough at first, but once you learn to play by its rules, it's super satisfying to complete a mission together without ever getting so much of a scratch. Remember back to the beginning of February when we promised we'd play Dying Light 2? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you did because Dying Light is easily our most recommended game of all time. But unfortunately, as much as we wanted to play Dying Light 2 on launch, the co-op was a total mess. Playing together meant you'd probably encounter crashes, black screens, and way too many bugs. The developers quickly got to work and did release a patch on March 12th that specifically addressed all the co-op issues. So we want to say the current state is healthy, but it'll be hard to say until we jump in. And yes, we will jump in and we're very excited to once we finally do. So we include it here because from what I've read, the people who have played Dying Light 2 together and not faced issues have really enjoyed their experience. And at some point this year, we look forward to making sure that's the case for us too. When Witch Queen was released to overwhelming praise, Gabe and I were like Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy answering the Call of Duty for the first time. We knew we had to step in, but it initially had a few hiccups. Our first playthrough of Witch Queen's campaign was just okay because we were still adjusting to everything Destiny has become since we last played in 2017, and that was very overwhelming. But by the time of our second playthrough on the Legendary difficulty, that was all behind us and we got to enjoy what ended up being one of our best cooperative experiences of the year so far. The Legendary campaign pushed our squad of three, shout out to Stompy, in the best and most cooperative ways possible. We had to use every ability in tandem, constantly communicating and rethinking how to approach a level. It was awesome and it really opened our eyes to what Destiny can be. Since then, we've tried our best to keep up with season passes, but being part-time game critics means that's next to impossible. But if you want a long-term game to play with your friends and you think you can get over that initial awkwardness and keep up with season passes, I can't believe I'm saying this, but maybe play Destiny 2. Wrapping up the busiest months of gaming like ever, we had the release of perhaps the most anticipated game in recent memory. Yes, I am of course talking about Elden Ring. 
Now look, we're huge Souls fanboys. I mean, we practically worship Miyazaki. If you're a fan of the channel, you already know this. But in our review of Elden Ring, we pointed out some of the ways that co-op falls short, namely in its lack of shared progression. We still recommended you play this as up to three friends, but just know you have to put in a little more effort than usual to make the whole co-op experience work for you. Once you're in it though, man, this game can be so much fun. Exploring the beginning section of the map together was truly magical as were some of the later game dungeons. Now easily the best part was the incredible build diversity and how we were able to craft an amazing team composition that evolved throughout the whole game. But if you still can't get over those multiplayer hurdles, there's an incredible mod exclusive to PC that makes the game truly seamless. It's a thing of beauty and its creator honestly deserves a noble prize for his work. The mod allows you to rest up bonfires together, ride horses together, and implement shared progression among a host of other things. It's everything we dreamed of and I'm gonna stop it right here because I'm gonna start crying at how amazing it looks. Moving on to March, we had a pair of indies that garnered a lot of attention, the first being Core Keeper. At a glance, Core Keeper is a mix of Terraria and Stardew Valley featuring 8 player co-op online, but it also throws in some survival mechanics you find in a game like Valheim or Don't Starve. It looks like a great sandbox to just hang out with your friends in, as you can build bases together, craft, and gear up to fight bosses. It's currently in early access, but like I said, it's received a ton of positive press. Polygon had a glowing write-up that said it has an exciting amount of deaths for a game that feels simple at first blush. Corekeeper does a great job of slowly revealing its crafting systems and the breadth of ways you can build up your base. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds great to me. Ending March in style is Young Souls, whose art direction is among my favorites in this whole list. This is a two-player local co-op beat-em-up with some light RPG elements where you play as two twins named Jen and Tristan. After playing through Shredder's Revenge, we're really keen on playing this one. The RPG elements sound really cool as the way you can gear up your twin fundamentally changes how they play, which of course sounds right up our alley. It's also been praised for its mature story, which is always a plus for me in a co-op game. Game Informer had this to say of the writing, solid writing treats players to a likable cast and a more emotionally charged story than expected. Seeing Jen and Tristan ponder over their actions and discover that both sides of a conflict can commit atrocities with good intentions brings welcome self-awareness. There's a lot more to this game than meets the eye, so we'll definitely be diving into it sometime this year. My wife and I played through the first two episodes of the Skywalker Saga back at launch and had a really good time. Then my wife remembered she much prefers to watch Downton Abbey over playing video games. No offense, babe. But I think I caught enough of the game to get a sense that the co-op is certainly worth suggesting if you're cool with split-screen gameplay. I mean, the game itself is great, so just cut it right down the middle and make it completely playable for two players, right? That was precisely the developer's thought process. Take a single player game, make it two players. And in some areas it worked, like when we did the pod race together and it turned into a very tense competition. But in others, it was a bit awkward, like when Emily decided to take time off to collect coins while I fought Darth Maul. It's a wonder Qui-Gon dies in the end of that battle. But either way, it's a great game with good co-op, you can't go wrong. One of the games that really inspired this video is Ember Knights. It's a hack and slash roguelite indie title that launched into early access back in April to not much fanfare, but deserves us stepping in and giving it some recognition. Only God as a Geek has reviewed it so far, but they did give it an 8.5 and said, you can play with up to three other people, and doing so makes fighting the different enemies way more fun. There's little room for coordinated attacks or coming up with a plan, but it's much more exciting when you have someone else to play with. It also has very positive reviews on Steam and has received a few updates since its release. So at least keep it on your radar or wishlist it for when it is in 1.0, we hope we'll see you there when it does release in full. The We Were Here series of games has been recommended to us as early as the first year of the channel. So when we heard the fourth game in the series was hitting next-gen consoles, we knew this was our chance to finally jump in. IGN gave it an 8 out of 10 saying, if you've got a like-minded friend who loves puzzles and escape rooms as much as you do, We Were Here Forever is a very special game with a 12-hour co-op campaign full of some of the most clever puzzles around. We're still working our way through this one, but I can say this. The walkie-talkie mechanic is one of the coolest mechanics we've seen in an online co-op game yet. As for the rest of the game, we're not really sure yet, but you can hear our verdict on it when our review goes live in the next couple weeks. 
One of the most talked about co-op games this year is V Rising, as it's remained towards the top of the Steam chart since release, which is pretty impressive if you ask me. V Rising is a survival co-op game you can play in either 4 or 10 player co-op online, depending on your server mode. It's the ultimate vampire fantasy, but not like Twilight vampires. No, this is like Nosferatu or Dracula kind of vampires, you know, the OGs. You build a castle with your clan, go out hunting at night, and gather resources to craft and become stronger. You can also go out during the day, but you have to travel in the shadows or you'll sparkle, I mean burn to death. Every aspect looks super cooperative from the crafting and even building the castle together. We're super stoked to dive into this soon, so expect a review in the next coming months. So admittedly, Andrew and I have massively slept on the Sniper Elite series, okay? We admit it. But we've heard the message loud and clear, Sniper Elite 5 is a seriously fun co-op game. The latest entry feels more akin to the Hitman series, since you have a lot more mobility, which sounds awesome to me. And with the second sniper on your team, you're able to conduct all sorts of sweet timed assassinations. Aside from the two-player online co-op campaign, there's a three-player survival mode that's more of a wave-based, guns blazing kind of thing. From what I've heard, this checks off all the boxes when it comes to co-op games, and lucky for you, we're hopping into it real soon. Stay tuned for our full thoughts on this one when our review goes live over the next couple weeks. The Quarry was released with solid reviews from critics and mostly positive reviews from fans. That's awesome, and I like seeing this playable movie genre expand over time. It also has two co-op modes, with one being a little bit more superior to the other. The local co-op is excellent and a commendable experience, which is why The Quarry made it into this video. Between the nine playable characters, you can divide up responsibility for each player sitting on the couch with you. Then for the rest of the story, you make the decisions for that character and play as that character. Pass the controller around as you pass the popcorn. I think that's really cool. Unfortunately, the online mode is a different story. Instead of individually playing as a character in the online mode, the host plays as everyone and the rest of the players just watch. They get to vote on decisions, but that's it. One person enjoys the experience while the others watch. We were super bummed they didn't just keep what made the local co-op special, so maybe just stick to local play for this one, guys. Easily one of the best co-op games we played this year is Shredder's Revenge. The music, animations, and overall goofiness just make this such an entertaining game to play through with your friends. It wasn't mechanically deep cooperatively speaking, but we didn't really care. It was just simply a good time. I mean, how can you not love little Donnie playing his Game Boy down there, or our favorite Ninja Boy working the mall food court? There's just so much charm here, I doubt you won't have a blast with friends. Shredder's Revenge is, so far, one of the best co-op games of the year. As Michelangelo would put it, Kawa freaking bunga, my dudes. We're finishing up our time with the Sunbreak expansion for Monster Hunter Rise, so expect a full review soon. But to no one's surprise, this is a really good time. I will say it's not a perfect package, it's front-loaded with older monsters. And there was a while where I thought we had a Pam, they're the same picture moment on our hands. But a little over halfway through our playtime, we hit the point where it's new monster after new monster, and it was awesome. Each one was a banger. I'll hold back for more on it come to our review, but trust me, Monster Hunter Sunbreak will be one of the best co-op experiences of the year. Like we were here forever, Escape Academy neatly falls into the puzzle co-op genre. But instead of escaping the castle of a maniacal jester, here your task was breaking out of various escape rooms. It's sitting at a strong 80 open critic score with Rock Paper Shotgun saying this. It's a charming escape room sim that's filled with clever puzzles that reward and rarely frustrate. The entire thing can be played with a bud too, making this a brilliant co-op jaunt. Honestly, this one surprised us and quickly climbed the ranks of our Gotta Play It Nets list of co-op games. It's a short 5 hour game, it's on Game Pass, and can be played in both 2 player online or local. So yeah, we're dying to dive into this one as soon as possible. Before we wrap up, I want to mention a few of the co-op experiences that have been released this year that didn't make our video and you might be a little confused as to why. First off, there's Tiny Tina's Wonderland, which for most critics hit well, but we did not jive with. Notably, critics could not play in co-op pre-launch, and I think that's a big point. The classes feel stale when playing in a squad, with everyone just kind of blending together, and that's really disappointing. Tiny Tina's does some good for Borderlands, but ultimately was not enough for us. There's also Cuphead's Delicious Last Chorus DLC, which has a local co-op mode. I've never been keen on playing this game in co-op, but when I do, I feel like it's even more difficult than it already is, which is saying something. 
but the DLC itself is excellent and some people probably wouldn't agree with me and do enjoy the co-op. So here's me acknowledging my limitations as a slightly above average gamer. Finally, we know what you're all thinking. Where is the love for Ryan's Rescue Squad? Honestly, we tried getting into Rescue Squad but felt far too cognitively challenged by the gameplay elements presented to us. It really just comes down to this. We're baby gamers and you have to be big boy gamers to recognize the greatness that is Ryan's Rescue Squad. To those of you who can, I say rescue on Ranger, rescue on. And there you have it, the best co-op games of 2022 so far. If we were to call it now, some of our favorite co-op games we've played include Destiny 2 The Witch Queen, Shredder's Revenge, and Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. But there's still a ton of games to catch up on, and we still have games like Gotham Knights, Warhammer 40k Darktide, and Sons of the Forest to look forward to. At the end of the year, we'll compile only the best of the best for our best co-op games of 2022 video. So while a game like Rainbow Six Extraction made it onto this list, there's no guarantee it'll make it onto the final cut against a stiff competition. Our goal with this channel will always be to give you guys everything you need to determine whether a game is worth checking out for you and your best friends. If you feel like we've done that, stick around by subscribing or helping us out with a like or comment below. In the meantime, expect to review on We Were Here Forever and Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak in the next week or two. Until then, we'll catch you next time on another episode of The Co-op Bros.